Thank you very much and good morning everyone. And uh, welcome to Trinidad and Tobago to those of you who are here for the first time. And it is really a pleasure to be here to chair your first session of the CPA C C CTO workshop. So, Honorable Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Wade Mark, Mr. Los Santos, De Alwis, Director, Head and Organization of the Department, Ms. Bernadette Lewis, Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, Mr. Joe Omardin, Acting Secretary General, ICANN, Mr. Chris C. Charan, CTO TAT, Telecommunications Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, my Permanent Secretary, Mrs. Ingrid Siratan, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Science and Technology, the management team of the CTO and the uh, CPA, members of the media, specially invited guests, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, again, welcome. But before I get into my opening remarks, let me say that today is a big day for us here in Trinidad and Tobago. And you may have noticed that quite a number of people wearing our national colors, red, black, and white, and that includes me. Today we are playing our final qualifying uh, football game. Some people call it soccer in different parts of the world. And we are playing Ecuador. And this is our female women soccer warriors, as we refer to them. And that if they win, we would be one of the 24 countries at the next World Cup, Women's World Cup in Canada. So it's a big day for us. <clears throat> so as one of the hats I wear as Minister of Sport, it is a big day for us. And all the much ado you see I'm talking and making connections is about that big event for us in Trinidad and Tobago today. It will be the first time our women are um, going that far. And I could say now without fear or favor or without being too, too presumptuous that we will be in Canada for the World Cup next year. Right, Mr. Speaker? <laughs> and I think, I think the better part of the news is that few members already or said they would like to attend the game this afternoon at 6. And the game is played in our national stadium, not too far from here. So the good news is all the much ado that I'm doing with my senior staff is to arrange 20 tickets so that those of you who would like to see the, this important game join us at the stadium this evening at 6 o'clock. So it is my distinct honor as Minister of Science and Technology, one of the hats I wear, to chair this session this morning on the ICT landscape. At this, the hosting of the Information and Communication Technology ICTs and parliamentarians for the Caribbean, Americas, and indeed the Atlantic region. Well, this is organized by the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization with the auspices of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. I'm very pleased that our very busy honorable speaker, I know he's a very busy person, he's very much involved in parliamentary issues, that he can have the time to join us today. So I think our speaker, Mr. Wade Mag, deserves a special round of applause for the efforts that he's putting here today. <laughs> it's a well-known fact that a country looks to its leaders to secure its future, to foster change, development, and serve as the, the guardians of nation's peace and future prosperity. In this regard, the parliament which comprises the democratically elected representatives of the people, plays a critical role in taking up this conflict. And within an increasingly dis, uh, disguised or disguised world, information and communication technology has accelerated globalization and radically transformed the socioeconomic paradigm in which we all live. 
the rapid diffusion of the internet, of mobile telephony, and I do say that Tran Tobago has one of the highest rates of mobile telephony. We are now at about 142% penetration, and that's very high. And that simply means for each person, there is approximately two cell phones. I guess with number portability and suing, and the chairman of TAT is here, that would be a thing of the past because one phone, one, tel one cell phone with the number portability will mean that we could access all of the telecoms providers currently exist in the country. So the rapid diffusion of the internet, of mobile telephone, and of broadband network all underscore the pervasiveness of technology to the extent that ICT is being viewed globally as critical components of the human development. As the importance of ICT lies not in the technology itself, but in its ability to shape economic, social, and political structures. ICT's uh, present or myriad of opportunities to connect, to educate, and to empower. That is the power of ICT's and how we build out broadband technology and utilize ICT in our everyday life. This focus of this laudable event is to showcase the potential use of ICTs for developing and, and the ways in which ICTs could be used to improve parliamentary processes. The National ICT Vision articulates that this country will become, and I quote, a dynamic knowledge-based society driven by the innovative use of ICTs to enhance the social, economic, and cultural development of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, end of quote. The National ICT Plan, which is for the period of 2014-2018, called SMART, lays the roadmap for the actualization of this vision and is structured along the following five thematic areas, namely, one, innovation and human capital development, two, access and digital inclusion, three, e-business and ICT sector development, four, infrastructure development, and five, e-government. It is crucial to highlight that a critical element of this, the successful deployment of national ICT plan is the establishment of the supporting e-legislative framework that creates the essential enabling e-environment that is required to structure sustainable ICT development. So therefore, the development of broadband, development of ICTs, it is very critical that you have the necessary legislative backbone to support all of the ICT initiatives. I would like to underscore that this is also a critical area where the role of Parliament serves as the critical linchpin in the promotion of the development and inclusion of ICTs. It is our job to create the best environment for national development through our unwavering support for the development of a comprehensive legislative agenda. As with any transformational change initiative that involves a paradigm shift, and behavioral change, the challenges of achieving advanced ICT development are very real. It is therefore to be understood or to be underscored that a successful science and technology sector is the partnership, a collaboration between government and the stakeholders and the citizens. From my country's perspective, we have certainly learned that in the development and promotion of a nation's ICT agenda and the development of the ICT landscape, there is an identified need for dialogue with various stakeholders, both nationally and internationally, in crafting policies that reflect national needs and interests. So this seminar, this workshop here today is very timely and very effective. 
as each of our nation take steps or to develop our own ICTs. In developing our own ICTs does not necessarily mean we are do doing this in a silo. We are living in a global village. We interact with each other. As we go higher in our speeds of transmission, whether we're doing LTE or 4G or 5G as the discussions are going on now, we have to collaborate and develop ICT so that we could even shrink the world and we could have faster and more effective communication. So in closing, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I thank the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and the Commonwealth Telecommunication Organization, as well as the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago for hosting this event. You have provided an excellent opportunity to bring key ICT-centered discussions to the fore. Through this event, you are also reinforcing the importance of ICTs in the parliamentary and the democratic process. I thank you for your commitment and look forward to the sessions to be hosted throughout the course of the day and tomorrow's proceedings. So I therefore ask you to give it your fullest. Uh, I look forward to the great participation that I anticipate here today. And just to say, I hope many of you will consider our offer to visit the stadium this evening and to see Trey and Tobago make it into the, for the first time in history, the first female World Cup in Canada in 2015. Thank you all and God bless you. Good morning. Um, on behalf of all of us, let me thank the Honorable Minister for the kind gesture and providing uh, tickets to watch the match today. And uh, let's wish Trinidad and Tobago all the best. Uh, before I start the presentation, let me give you some uh, a brief background. We are delighted to partner with Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, what, which is one of the uh, sister Commonwealth organizations. Um, there will be a brief description of CTO in my presentation, but one of the challenges we have faced in the past is ICTs is an area or, or uh, uh, an industry that impacts all segments of society, from governance to commerce to people's interactions. We organize events, we organize capacity building workshops, uh, we organize all sorts of interactions. And we have a great deal of uh, participation from regulators, policymakers, operators, and even civil society. But one thing we have noted was that uh, the engagement of parliamentarians have been not as great as the other segments. But on the other hand, parliamentarians create the legislative underpinning for the sector to grow. So we started discussions with the uh, CPA some time back and I believe two years back we signed the memorandum of an MOU. Uh, we held one workshop in 2013 where uh, we, in, in partnership with UNCTAD, we held a workshop for uh, ICT legislation. Our Secretary General attended the uh, CPA annual conference again two years back where he conducted a workshop on social media and this is the third step of our partnership and I hope that we will go from strength to strength and we will have many more, more uh, workshops of this nature. Uh, just to set our expectations right, when we, when CTO and CPA started discussions about the workshop, we wanted to address two things. One is about legislating for ICTs. The, without a strong and robust facilitative legislative framework, the industry cannot prosper. So how do we inform parliamentarians about the needs, wants and priorities of the sector so that the legislative framework is strong? Number two, ICTs provide numerous channels for parliamentarians to link up with their people. I mean, parliamentarians are there to represent the views of, their, the, of the public. Closer you get to the, the people, uh, stronger your interactions are with the public, better, represent, better you are able to represent their views. So ICTs provide many channels and how do we inform parliamentarians to make use of modern day ICTs for their purposes. In keeping with those two objectives in mind, we created the program in a way that first day we talk about legislating for ICTs and tomorrow we consider how to use ICTs for parliamentary processes. 
so um, going to my presentation this is about ICT landscape now one can talk at least one week non-stop about ICT landscape it is so complex so vast so broad that uh, one hour is totally inadequate to talk about ICT landscape what I wanted to do was to give you a flavor of the ICT landscape just few bits and pieces to uh, set the context for the following presentations so as I said CTO is the oldest and the largest Commonwealth organization in the field of ICTs we have been set up way back in 1901 as the Pacific Cables Board went through several phases of life today we have Commonwealth countries as members who form our governing council and uh, in interestingly Trinidad and Tobago currently holds the first vice chair of uh, CTO council and we have a second tier of membership called sector members which brings together non commonwealth countries civil society and industry because in the ICT sector it is that public sector private sector consultations that have been the driving uh, force behind the, the recent successes um, ICTs so, the shortest possible explanation or description of ICTs I could found was this integration of telecommunications that is fixed lines which used to be about 20 years back the only means of telecommunications now mobiles and various forms of wireless communications computer that is hardware software uh, and storage and audio visual systems which will enable users to access store transmit and manipulate information we access information we store them in various forms uh, transmit them via internet or intranet or using mobile phones and manipulate information this is uh, taken from uh, uh, an academic journal just to get a sense of what ICTs can do for poverty alleviation because there is a sense when we talk about ICTs that it is a kind of a, a, a tool more for fun and games it used to be because when mobile started making its appearances about 15 20 years back it was very expensive mobile core rates are very high but today it is even considered as a fundamental right and mobiles actually do contribute to socio-economic development and this in a way tries to represent how it contributes to poverty alleviation from ICT policy it influences development strategies which leads to local access that means local access means the last mile from telecenters to uh, schools to libraries to various forms uh, I remember uh, last year we completed a project in Trinidad and Tobago to set up a, a telecenter which is the beginning of a telecenter project the government is running uh, ICT also ICT policy also encourages government as a user there is ICT infrastructure physical infrastructure methods finally all this ends up with people farmers get the information using mobile phones and if you uh, and in South Asia there are many examples of uh, price market rates being delivered to mobile phones fishermen get weather information before they go to fish there was a time when they realized the weather is not that good when they are out in the sea but today they get in places like Bangladesh they get the latest weather reports on the mobile there are many ways in which ICTs have led directly to poverty alleviation and then on to the internet and this is the uh, the representation of internet I found from uh, one of my colleagues Albert there will talk more about it but when you look at the internet it is borderless if you look at it that is exactly that is supposed to be the picture of the world with the internet interposed on that but one can't find one's own country there because it is borderless it is everywhere and what happens in an internet minute I'm sure some of you at least would have seen this slide many times it never fails to fascinate me in a minute um, many things that happen um, it's too small for you to read but uh, I will share the slides with you but a number of searches number of people who sign up on YouTube number of people who sign up to Facebook uh, number of videos being uploaded to uh, YouTube there are specific numbers given there and you can see that it's staggering one cannot even imagine this amount of information being uploaded and being shared between people in one minute then we went on to the social media social map all sorts of social media from Facebook to Twitter to MySpace there are many hubs 
which allow people to interact across borders, across cultures, and free. I mean, if you have a broadband connection or if you have a decent internet connection, you are onto social media and you are interacting with people whom you would never have even imagined of interacting. This is some data I found uh, about the use of social media. Facebook, monthly active users by 2014. Facebook, 1.2 billion people. And YouTube has 1 billion, Twitter has 255 million, LinkedIn 255 million, and uh, Snapchat 200 million, and Instagram 30 million. Especially if you look at Facebook, 1.2 billion people means it's one of the largest gatherings of human beings in one place. And they are always online or they are always interacting. YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, which, which is not, which may not be as popular as Facebook, but is a, a social media platform for professionals. 255 million people, 255 million professionals sharing their information, sharing their CVs, and also informing each other about their activities. I mean, CTO has a, a LinkedIn page where we post all our information about our activities and even our vacancies. This is another interesting piece of information I found about the practical use of social media because when we talk about Facebook, we generally tend to think of um, digital natives, younger people who grew up in the digital age, who started using uh, ICTs and who started using ICTs for interaction. In our, you know, when we are growing up, it was more physical interaction. We meet people face to face and we talk to them. But nowadays, it is more about social media. But it is not, social media is not just about simple interaction or making friends. There are practical uses of social media. And this slide, social media media job hunting by network, 18.4 million by Facebook, 8 million by uh, Twitter, 10.2 million by LinkedIn. And then it comes to the storage. I mean, these are various aspects I just wanted you to get a sense of. Uh, there was communication from internet and then social media came through where we interacted with people and then came the, the practical users of social media and now storage. It used to be a time when mainframe computers used to rule the world. It was you know, huge machines in, in buildings, air condition. And then came the PC. The PC had a decent amount of storage. And today, most people will go to cloud. And there are many cloud operators from Google to, uh, uh, to Microsoft, Dropbox. All these are mechanisms for storing information. And that information can be accessed from anywhere in the world by anyone whom you would want that information to be accessed. Especially something like Dropbox. We used to e email around and if the, the attachment is too big, you can't email it. Today you put it on the Dropbox, share it with someone, that person downloads it. Any amount of information, I mean, see reasonable amount of information available. Um, some of the information I found, I, uh, the Honorable Minister spoke about the internet penetration, or rather mobile penetration in uh, Trinidad and Tobago, which is in 140, at the level of 140%, which is very high. I tried to get the information about Caribbean itself. It was a bit difficult, but this is what I found. By the end of 2013, 16 million internet users, and penetration rate is 39.6%, and by the end of 2012, 6 million Facebook subscribers. So, I mean... Almost half of the internet users are Facebook subscribers. That is only one service. Then there are many other services. So if we uh, interrelate all these other services to internet usage, you can see that they are using it not simply to watch something or, or, or just simply to browse the net, but they are using it for other purposes as well. What will the future hold? And these are some predictions I took from uh, various research reports. Alcatel Lewis and came up with one. And they believe by 2014, and that is today, 70% of internet traffic will be video. And 70% of mobile traffic will be mobile internet. It used to be a time, even today, I would not have data roaming on my phone because it cost you an arm and a leg. But it used to be the same case in a country, within the country itself. But today, majority of mobile traffic is mobile internet. It's not simply to talk, it's not simply voice traffic, it is internet traffic. And uh, they expect by 2015 to have 2.5 billion smartphones. That means each one of them is a mini computer which has more storage in it than a computer used to have even four or five years back and with more processing power and that will lead into more mobile internet penetration. And three times more machine to machine traffic in the next five years. 
because today the traffic is generated by an individual at least initiated by an individual towards another individual or a machine but there is an expectation that three times more machine to machine traffic in five years that means the uh, computers or equip the machines talking to each other uh, refrigerator understanding how much milk has been consumed and automatically placing an order with the supermarket to deliver milk many things and uh, another report by Cisco believes that by 2018 over half of all IP traffic will originate from non PC devices that is TVs tablets smartphones and household utilities global internet traffic will be 64 times it is size in 2005 that means within nine years it has grown up grown by 64 times the number of connected devices will be nearly thrice the global population that means each one of us will have uh, not that each one of us will have three devices but there will be three times more devices that will be talking to each other than without human intervention and broadband speeds will be 42 bits per second from 16 in 2013 today they are talking even about some countries like South Korea or Japan Singapore they are talking about even 100 Mbps and uh, it would take an individual this is something I found very interesting it would take an individual more than 5 million years to watch the amount of video that will cross the global IP network each month each month so that is the amount of information that will be going around in terms of videos only that means our practices even in entertainment are due to change it's not that we will go to a film hall or it is not that we will watch it on TV but we will watch it on our, our handheld devices and today there is another I, I found another uh, piece of information that in UK young children watch only half the amount of television they does watch but that is on TV they watch twice at that many on a handheld device or a, uh, in any handheld device so that means they are their habits of watching television is changing from a television to a handheld device where is the television going to be in future um, I thought I should add this because uh, we are talking about internet and that is the cyberspace I showed that picture which does not have any borders so cyberspace people consider that as the fifth dimension or, or, or the fifth um, element that does not have any borders no one person can say or no one country can say that this is my cyberspace so the rules of governance management and interactions have to change necessarily because what we apply today in terms of governance cannot apply in the same form to cyberspace um, so it is not a single entity it's dispersed not separated by national boundaries no one can say that these mine and collectively influenced if you take even uh, some issues like um, freedom of in uh, freedom of information on the net there are many debates going around which would not have occurred in the physical world because in the physical world if you want to have your opinion heard you will have to have either a newspaper column or some kind of a medium which cost you money anyone can set up a blog on the internet and that can have any amount of information and that's more about uh, community the, the scale of people who will interact with who will view that website and who will subscribe to that view becomes the majority view um, there were many debates about how to govern the cyberspace which are still going on um, in 2012 in one major conference this uh, these divergence of opinion came into sharp contrast and some countries believe that it should be a government led legislated form of governance some countries believe that it should be left to the people for the individual because internet has come so far because it leverages or empowers individuals so what CTO thought was since we all Commonwealth countries subscribe to a certain set of principles which are captured in the Commonwealth Charter uh, how could we help this debate or how could we help uh, stakeholders come up with a model that addresses all concerns so we started uh, a project to develop a common cyber governance model and uh, we held various consultations right across uh, one was held in Jamaica for Caribbean uh, during a CTO event taking into account all the views and the common charter and other best practices we came up with four principles which we believe should be uh, referred to 
when countries implement practical measures in cyber governance. This was uh, adopted by Commonwealth ICT ministers on 3rd and 4th March 2014 in London and uh, I have given the web link, you can find the, the full model there. But the four principles, we contribute to a safe and effective global cyberspace. I cannot utilize the cyberspace unless it is safe, it is like walking on the streets. Unless I am safe, I won't be able to walk on the streets, meet people, uh, do my business. So it has to be safe and it has to be effective. Our actions in cyberspace support broader economic and social development. Cyberspace is not simply for fun and games, it's for higher purposes. It has the potential to deliver real value, developmental value. So our actions should support broader economic and social development. Third, we act individually and collectively to tackle, tackle cybercrime. It's a kind of a misnomer because I don't believe there is something called cybercrime. There are crimes which are committed on cyberspace and that is what came to be known as cybercrime. And because of its nature, because of its borderless nature, jurisdictional issues, I, the problems of identifying people, it is a bit more difficult than uh, resolving uh, uh, crime in the physical world. So we have to act individually and collectively to tackle cybercrime. The key point there is collectively because I could be in London perpetrating a, a fraud on someone here in Trinidad using a server in US and collecting money to a bank somewhere in Tokelo Islands. Where does the jurisdiction lie? So we have to act collectively to tackle these cyber crimes. Last one, we each exercise our rights and meet our responsibilities in cyberspace because there are no rights without responsibilities. If I am using internet, it is my responsibility to make sure that I do not download virus and I do not email uh, an attachment to someone who has a virus in it. Just as much as, uh, I mean, this, the, the best example I can think of is Ebola. Countries took some drastic measures to prevent people from moving around and infecting others. I think that is the right decision. Same applies to cyberspace. If I cannot, if I do not take protective measures, I should not be contacting others and infecting them. We, at CTO, we call this cyber hygiene. Because just as much as we have to be hygienic in cyber, the, the physical space, we should be hygienic in the cyberspace as well. And on to cyber security, and uh, there, what we wanted was to generate socio-economic development, cyberspace has to be safe, secure, and resilient. Goes without saying. Uh, so what we did was to develop a model to assist Commonwealth countries develop their national cyber security strategies. Trinidad and Tobago is one of the countries in uh, one of the commonwealth countries in Caribbean that has a cyber security strategy, national cyber security strategy, but we believe that others should also have their strategy because a national strategy will spell the difference between uh, piecemeal action and a cohesive approach. So we based it on the cyber governance principles, good practices around the world, we research about 70 operational cyber security strategies and, uh, op and uh, came up with this commonwealth approach for developing national cyber security strategies. The web link is given there and now we are in the process of showcasing it around uh, the Commonwealth. About two weeks back there was one workshop in Barbados for Caribbean and we are very happy to help any other Commonwealth countries in Caribbean to uh, develop their national cyber security strategies. And that's the end of my presentation. So the key point is let's make ICTs work for us. It's not the other way around. ICTs should not drive us. We should be driving ICTs. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Atta, for such a wide-ranging and enlightening presentation. I realize that we are sort of running late based on our scheduled program, so we may have to make some amendments if we are to get through uh, at a reasonable time. So let me put this first suggestion and see if I get your agreement. I think maybe we should have the next presentation, ask Mr. Harris to do it, and then we could have some discussions after that, and then break for coffee. How about that? Is that okay with everyone? This way we take the two presentations, and then you can respond to each presenter with your um, input or whatever questions or comments you may wish to make. Is that okay? All right, well, if that's okay with you, thank you very much. And may I ask Mr. Michael Harris, the member of the Legislative Assembly for Ontario, 
to do his presentation. Mr. Harris here. Yeah? Yeah, right. Welcome. Let's put our hands together and welcome you. All right. Well, uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, will uh, try to make it as brief as possible. Uh, and it's a real honor to be here, of course. I uh, just checked the weather at home, and it's uh, minus 10. It feels like feels like minus 17. Uh, and just looking at the name cards uh, from where you all are coming in from is uh, warming to me. Uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here, of course. Uh, to lend my perspective, uh, working as a legislator, a parliamentarian in Ontario, Canada, with our new and emerging information and communication technologies. And I'm not sure if uh, we're loading our slideshow up there. Oh, you'll need the clicker. As uh, was noted, I am the uh, member of Provincial Parliament for the riding of uh, Kitchener-Conestoga, an area that uh, may have more perspective uh, than most given that it is a technology hub uh, of Ontario and home uh, to research in motion, as many of uh, you may know it better, Blackberry. Uh, Kitchener is about an hour west of uh, Toronto, about four hours west of our nation's capital in Ottawa. So I'll wait to see if we can get that fired up at all or <laughs> I'll just keep going and you can view the slideshows as we go. So um, I want to just quickly start off. Uh, I'm not just sure I have not had an opportunity to meet uh, all of you yet. I, I did see a, a few folks that had uh, blackberries, but I just want to get an idea uh, of uh, uh, where all you're at with technology. And I'm just curious on how many of the folks around the table have uh, you know, either a smartphone or a tablet with them today, uh, an I iPad. Uh, so pretty much everybody. Um, now, of, of those folks, uh, how many of you have your own parliamentarian website? Uh, everyone have their own uh, website at all? Just show of hands who actually has their own website. All right, so, so there's a few folks still to go. Uh, and of, co of course, uh, who has a, a Twitter account, a Facebook account, a LinkedIn account around the table? Most of us, of course. Um, well, I'd like you to think about the uh, back just over a decade uh, ago and think of how many hands would have been in the air had I asked that question 10 years ago. You know, social media was little more than blog sites and YouTube videos. Facebook was just finding its legs. And the Twitter bird had yet to take flight, never mind finding a voice to tweet. Smartphones with web access were beginning to morph the old flip phones and tablets were still a couple years away. And yet here we are a decade later with smartphones, tablets, and social media all having taken such a vital role in our day-to-day -day lives, it would, would really be difficult to consider how we would even move forward without them. Uh, even myself, I find that uh, I'm uh, now uh, subject to phantom um, tweets or phantom uh, vibrations on my phone thinking that it has uh, gone off and yet it hasn't. So forgive me if I uh, am uh, checking my phone throughout the day. It's just a bad habit I have, and I'm sure you all, uh, many of them uh, may have the same. So I don't uh, think I need to tell you, but in a world where everything is changing, on an almost daily basis, specifically the way people interact and connect, the way they give and receive information, it makes it hard to keep up. And there's no doubt that changes to society at large, changes to the ways in which we communicate, require changes for us as parliamentarians. Just think of the entire new forms of political participation. Social media itself has provided the springboard to allow issues of time and space to be eliminated delivering instantaneous connections. The increased speed and breadth of political information reaching citizens has followed in lockstep with the rise and development of new and emerging forms of information communication technologies. Citizens now have the ability and the tools to monitor and connect with elected officials in more ways than ever before, thanks to the use of email, websites, online video, Twitter, Facebook, and more options with each passing day. The increasing availability of communication enhancing mobile devices and applications that allow for the provision of access to information at any time from nearly any place has been a total game changer. We've gone from zero to as of 2013, 
73.4% worldwide market phone internet user penetration. In 2017, figures suggest that more than 90% of internet users will access online content through their phones. It can all, of course, be a little bewildering. I must apologize that some of, uh, and some of the responsibility, of course, for the continuing change we all work to keep up with has roots, in fact, in the area that I represent. As noted earlier, there's a company that you may have heard of headquartered in my area of uh, Kitchener-Waterloo that helps spearhead this forward movement. I speak of BlackBerry, of course, which given that it is based in my area and one of the largest employers, I'm hoping that it is BlackBerry, of course, that each of you are picking up uh, for your daily texting and tweeting chores. And if not, I'm glad to show you mine. Uh, perhaps at the end of this uh, couple days, you'll have switched from whatever device you are using to a BlackBerry. I have to just note, uh, I was watching a uh, following Twitter last week, and if, if anybody was watching the news, uh, President Obama was uh, boarding uh, Marine Force One. Uh, he got out, ran back into the White House, came back, and the media was asking him why he uh, went in, and he said he forgot his BlackBerry. So uh, uh, he, like I, uh, would not be able to leave home without it. You know, as a key company in uh, mobile communications, uh, BlackBerry continues to lead the sector in new directions while playing a pivotal role of course, in my area, in Waterloo Region's economy, which itself is home to hundreds of technology companies like Google, OpenText, Desire to Learn, to, to just simply name a few. For more, for more than a decade, legislators in Ontario, Canada, the U.S., and across the world have relied on this smartphone to send secure emails, search the web for important news and issues of the day, send instant uh, BlackBerry messages to staff and colleagues, or use the map feature to navigate through new towns and cities across the province. They've been a valued part of our daily business life. Newer generation smartphones have seen BlackBerry add many new features to serve our personal lives too, and that includes uh, Google Androids, of course, iPhones, etc., with the ability to operate apps like Skype, Twitter, BBM Video, and my personal favorite, TuneIn Radio, so when I'm away from my local radio station, I can connect and hear the morning's uh, news uh, right from the comfort of my own um, home or office. As well as many other entertainment features, we're able to keep in touch with our family, friends, supporters, and constituents while being on the go from our legislative building uh, to events in our ridings. Locally, of course, BlackBerry has done so much for our community and our province over the years, injecting billions of dollars into our economy, creating thousands of local jobs, and establishing a culture of ingenuity and innovation throughout the Waterloo region, so you'll understand why I take the time to do a little boasting. Of course, beyond our emails and websites that we can access through our smartphones, uh, BlackBerry or not, social media sites have become the go-to apps that help inform our daily lives while allowing interactive communication. Folks, in 2016, and as we heard before, it is estimated that there will be around 2.13 billion social network users around the globe. That's up from 1.4 billion in 2012. Internationally, there are over 275 million Twitter users and 1.1 billion active users for the social media granddaddy of all Facebook, which still leads the pack. The potential for effective instant communication with vast numbers of those you represent is staggering and an absolute necessity as we move forward towards higher concentrations of social media connection. There's not a day and probably not an hour that goes by when myself or my office is not checking websites, sending tweets, posting video, issuing linked news releases and more, all in an effort to make use of the potential for communication that the nexus of smartphone proliferation and the rise of social media has allowed. And while other social media is massive in its communication potential in and of itself, as we know information and communication technology is much, much more than that. Of course, I will get to detailing my experiences in dealing with a, a wide array of options that we can avail ourselves tomorrow. But for now, I pro will provide just a brief description of just what we see out there and when it comes to the information and communication technology. There are so many possibilities and while this list is not comprehensive. It gives you an idea of a wide array of options available. 
When it comes to information and communication technology in 2014, we are talking about web-based platforms and options like online petitions. In fact, I have a couple on the go right now myself, scrapdriveclean.ca and groundtheflighttax.com. Websites, both legislative websites and those to drive campaigns. Of course, we've got e-newsletters, online surveys or polls, uh, videos using YouTube, uh, Twitter town halls, uh, Twitter feeds, of course, Reddit, Facebook, LinkedIn, and of course, the tried and true, which can provide access to all Facebook. So as I've been saying throughout, and as you can see, the opportunities are many, and I encourage everyone here to explore the possibilities, see how they can best work for you and your office and helping to communicate with those that you represent. All that said, and as I come to an end of my presentation here, there is no doubt that with opportunity also comes challenges. Indeed, while these technologies can make work easier, they also bring greater attention and therefore more scrutiny to the public governance environment. The convergence of technology and public policy has definite repercussions for parliamentarians across the globe, both good and, let's say, concerning. Beyond the obvious challenges of finding the time and money of meeting new and emerging communications demands, also comes tensions between new technologies, citizen expectations, and established parliamentary rules and traditions. Issues like government consideration and handling of online petitions, I would note that our assembly in Ontario does not acknowledge online signatures. The lack of instant communication when it comes to official records, such as Hansard or votes or, or, and proceedings. Often the official government website lags hours and often days behind while unofficial media has already put out unfettered commentary. The balancing of legitimate concerns for confidentiality in certain cases with the need for transparency. Not to mention the very real concern facing parliamentarians on the question of replying to Twitter or Facebook derogatory messages directed at us. Of course, a uh, piece of advice uh, to those and what I've taken personally is those that have taken it a personal on a personal level uh, and you face the question to tweet or not to tweet, I tend to go with the latter, of course. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that ICT has changed the world. It has changed our world, and just as it has created communication advances and opportunities for the public at large, as well as parliamentarians, it has also brought challenges which we must be equally aware of in order to properly address them as they arise. In the social media and smartphone-driven world of instant communication, the goals of open and transparent government married with the goals of political communications with citizens create new issues, opportunities and challenges. And of course, we must continue uh, to work to address them all. So I'll wrap that up at, at that. Uh, of course, I look forward to the next couple of days uh, chatting with you informally and, uh, and the next uh, two presentations will get more into depth, but I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak this morning and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you.